Okay, so I think we just start off. Maybe some other people, some more people will show up, but possibly because this is a presentation on about Internet Explorer. That's not why so many people are joining. Anyway, I want to give you now an overview of uh, performance diagnosis in Internet Explorer. As you know, there are tools around for Fire for Firefox, um, as well as for Safari, but when it comes to Internet Explorer, there hasn't been really a lot of options around. Uh, still, there are a lot of people still using uh, Internet Explorer, and so the user community is quite big, especially when you come to intranet applications. There's a lot of people actually using Internet Explorer, and there are performance problems in Internet Explorer. And just go through what you can do to solve them and how to use a free tool Dynatrace HX edition to uh, resolve the performance problems here. So, Dion today mentioned that a lot of software is about being sexy and creating an impression. And thinking about that, I again looked at the Internet Explorer logo and realized something. There's some similarity to this holy angel here, but so. Is Internet Explorer really that holy? Is it really behaving that well? Well, obviously not. So it's, I think, the most hated browser out there. But still, they're trying to create this um, image of the holy Internet Explorer. Well, as this is not the case, the question is, what can we actually do about it? So there are two approaches on how to solve problems with Internet Explorer. The first one is doing voodoo. So here's, here's an Internet Explorer. Uh, voodoo icon, well, that might not work that well, but at least you can try whether this solves the problems or not. The other approach is for the German-speaking ones, uh, you can read it for the English-speaking ones, Internet Explorer has to stay outside, so we say, okay, simply we don't care about Internet Explorer, uh, Skull people better use other browsers because things are working there better. However, reality is just a bit different. Uh, a lot of people, as I said, are using Internet Explorer, and we also have to find problems in there. And I'll show you that it's not that complicated as you might think, actually. So, what I see people often when they're searching uh, problems in Internet Explorer, especially because proper tooling is missing that, yes, uh, like the guy here, uh, who started searching for a nasty performance problem in his early 20s, now possibly being in his 80s, and still might not have found it. So a lot of here is a tooling question. The more information you get, the easier it is for you to find out what the actual problems might be, the faster you are resolving in those problems. And I took a quote here from a very famous book of Sun Tzu, The Art of War, uh, which says, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. So how often did you run into either a functional problem or a performance problem in Internet Explorer? So we're fighting a couple of hundred of those battles. Uh, the goal here really should be to get a better understanding of what's going on in Internet Explorer and how you can find out what's happening there. And this is what uh, my talk will be about, showing you how you can um, find problems in Internet Explorer. I put up a couple of topics. Uh, that I want to address here. The first one is normally you want to get a fast overview of what's going on in your web application. Just don't, you don't want to initially drill into those details, but initially you want to get a fast overview of what's going on in this application from a networking perspective, from a JavaScript perspective, also from a rendering time perspective. So just easily understand where is my problem actually? Is it whether a JavaScript problem, network problem? Uh, rendering problem whatsoever. So before going into the details of resolving a problem, you want to know what it actually is. Then one part of this is understanding the flow of time. So what has happened over time? When was something downloaded from the network? When was some JavaScript execution? How did this JavaScript execution lead to rendering, to additional network downloads, and the like, to really get a fast overview of what happened in an application? especially if you're thinking about really rich internet applications, taking Google Mail here as an example. There's a lot of going on constantly and you know, just want to have some understanding of what's happening in there and what might have caused uh, a problem. 
Next one is the network, uh, one of the low-hanging fruits in performance optimizations for web application. So what's going on in the network layer? What has been downloaded? How long have things taken to download? Have things been cached or haven't they been cached? How much time has been spent on the network, on the server time, uh, for DNS lookups and the like? Uh, then you want to know, okay, if some JavaScript has been executed or some event has been fired, what has actually been executed, and you want to get the whole flow, not kind of aggregated view, just for one specific event, what did this actually lead to in the browser? So that's what we refer to pure pass, really providing a transactional tracer for every single click instead of those aggregated values that if you have a couple of hundred user interface interactions, you don't have any idea what's really, what's really going on in the browser here. One thing that's very often coming to, coming when you talk about browsers and performance, and what we heard a lot uh, after we initially uh, released our Dynatrace Ajax edition is tell us more about rendering. So rendering is crucial to us. We want to understand rendering times. We want to find out in detail how rendering in the browser works, what effects rendering, why something rendered, why does it take so long, what's really going on there. Next one is collaboration. So very often you're not working alone. It's good as long as you're in a developer workspace, but someday your users or testers might come back and say, you know, it's simply not working. So you can ask them, okay, what did you do? And then you go to the web page yourself, try to do it yourself, which works quite fine. If it's publicly available, you don't need those, uh, the details of those users, but it's lost, and as soon as it's a real world web application, you know, it's private content and the like, you won't get all this information. You'd rather have the user actually being able to, to show you what he's actually done and you being able to analyze that data on hand. Additionally, you want, don't want to go over to that user and say, okay, now I'm um, just starting your browser with my debugging tools in and type what you just did. I mean, that's simply not the way it is actually working. So you rather want to capture that content, say, okay, capture it, send it back to me so that I can have a look at it. And finally, I want to become a bit to, to testing, so how you can use, uh, use it for testing purposes, how you can integrate performance analysis into testing and find out what's going on in testing here. Uh, I'll just show a short sample here. So, to show you a bit how you could uh, work on all those topics, I'll use a really complex website. I think probably one of the most complex Ajax website out there, which is the start page of Google. <laughs> okay, it's not a complex one, but I've chosen it because it has some uh, JavaScript uh, inside, it has some Ajax going on on the page, so if you type in the keyword, you will see that you get this quick results. And I've chosen this example simply um, because it actually shows you uh, how you can use the tool instead of having a very complex example where a lot of JavaScript is going on. So if I would rather choose Facebook to show you the same thing, first of all, you get all my Facebook messages that I don't want, and secondly, the, the application is much more complex, so that it will hide a bit of the, the process behind it rather than we're looking at what's going on in the application. So, just jump into uh, Dynatrace Ajax edition that I just launched here. So, what I'm just doing is really something very easy to do. I'm just going to the Google web page. Okay, I'm already there, fine. And what I'm doing now, I'm just typing here And what you see here, it's just refreshing this list, and this is obviously getting loaded um, from the server dynamically at runtime. So there's some matrix going on. So nothing really spectacular, uh, but still enough for us to see something going on, what's going on in the web page. Okay, so as I said, the first thing that we want to see is that we want to get a fast overview of what, what's going on. Well, it's quite easy if you look at one page. Um, but still, what, we, what we've looked at is, so what do you really want to see going on in the browser when something happens? So what do you want to understand? First of all, here we had our URL. And there are a couple of typical things you look at from a performance perspective when, when uh, looking at a website. And we try to somehow aggregate all this information in one page so that you can get an initial overview and understand really, so where, where could my problem be? 
like here re resources, so answering basic questions, how many resources have been loaded over the network and how many resources have been loaded from the cache. So if we just hit the page twice, you just can look at those two pages and say, okay, do we get all the content from the cache that we want to get from the cache or not? So as we see here, all images obviously come from the cache. Part of the JavaScript is coming from the cache as well. Uh, just the HTML and um, other portions of JavaScript are not coming from, um, directly loaded from the network and are not coming from the cache. Especially for validating your caching strategy, this is quite useful to see what is going on. Then from a networking perspective, uh, what you actually want to understand is where do you really spend your time on the network. So there are a lot of different points on the network where you can spend it here for DNS lookup, for initial connect, really the time on the server or the transfer time, so the time that is really used for sending back the contents. Because if something just takes long, you don't necessarily need why it's actually taking long. So is the server taking so long to produce the content? Is it a slow network? Or as we've also very often seen, is it possibly a DNS lookup that's just taking that long of time? And additionally, uh, what we didn't have here because the website was actually quite simple, other questions to answer like, okay, how long did you actually have to wait until some resource could be downloaded? So uh, as all of you know, browsers have a limited number of connections that they can open per domain. So long actually did it took for, uh, to, down, to have to wait for a certain resource. Um, secondly, what, what kind of JavaScript triggered there? So where is most of my JavaScript time uh, coming from? Is it coming from script blocks, keyboard events, uh, other sources? And additionally, which Java portions of JavaScript consume most of the time uh, on my website? So which, uh, in which we call it here APIs, see it libraries with a couple of different JavaScript libraries, you will see, okay, in which of those libraries did you spend uh, most of your time here? Just to see a bit more content, I'll just, oops, sorry, going back here. And now let it load. So obviously it is a bit slow. Let's just refresh it here in real time. And we will see the same here for the next request. So we see that Again, the JavaScript is now coming from the cache. However, images and HTML is now coming from uh, uh, from the uh, from directly from the network. And from a networking perspective, we see that we spend actually most time on the server and not really a lot of networking time here. Um, the second point is that okay, understand the flow of time. So, what did really happen over time? What do we have to actually have to do here? Um, Something that you really want to see is what really ha what did you really do? What does it really take? Maybe to take a bit more complex website. Let's take the actually it's quite fast as well. Taking one that just had a look at that takes a bit longer. Okay, going back here. So what we simply sum up here is the time spent from a CPU perspective, uh, JavaScript. So when was JavaScript executed? When did we render something? And in this case, from which domains have things been downloaded? And additionally, we see an event timeline here. So we see all major events like unload events that have been triggered. So how long did it take until the unload event? And what was done after the unload event? So we see here that then just something got downloaded some rendering occurred, rendering was scheduled again, then again some rendering and some JavaScript execution right in here. So especially if you're running longer tasks and you want to understand what's going on, it really helps you to get a first uh, quite nice overview of what's really going on on your web page. See, okay, how, what has really been done over time in those different performance relevant areas uh, of your application. The same for sure you got What everyone wants to see, what did happen on the networking layer, so that's also over time. So just use this page for one specific reason. Okay, because we see here, breakdown of all the pages have been downloaded, how big it was, whether it was retrieved from the cache or not, status codes and the like, and 
also all the content in here. And here also the split up in the different times of time. So here we see the wait time, so that's one of the examples where we actually have to wait to get that socket. So there is already parallel download going on on that page. Uh, how much time was wait time, connect time, server time, transfer time. So really trying to see how those different timings sum up to the download of a specific web page as well as we've seen all the request and response headers that you see out there. So classical network analysis that you see here, what was going on from that perspective, finding out where the actual problems on a specific page uh, might be, helping you to understand, uh, to understand that and what, has, what was going on there. And you can also specifically say, I just want to pick one of those resources, just a specific page, and see what how the download was. And also here in the timing chart, you'll see uh, what the actual time has been spent on. Like here we have this big blue part. If you look at that blue, is actually the transfer time. So here it took some time to transfer. Here we most of are waiting for socket connections. So it helps you to get a quick understanding of uh, what's actually going on in the web page download, as well as seeing the actual content. Um, additionally, so if we have now identified our page, we want to find out what, what was actually going on here, like in the Google page. And that's where I'm coming now to what we call a tracing analysis. So what we show here is are really all types of activities that were happening on the specific page. You can choose which ones you actually want to see, so network activities, uh, rendering activities, and the likes. So you see here really what, what's really happening at Google. We see here script execution, uh, as well as you see the code browser down here. So you see also the code parts which have been executed. So it's actually executed. It is just kind of threading mechanism in here. It just says times that the sequence is triggered, validating that field. And like, and here again, rendering activities. And also rendering being scheduled here, like taking this example here. Okay, seeing what's going on here. And especially as a rendering, what actually caused rendering to happen. So we see that you have a layout calculation and also scheduling of layouting here. So that's actually quite a deep insight into how rendering in the browser works because very often you just see that you did something and sometimes it takes long for the page to, to be rendered again. But what have you actually done in your code that caused that rendering in the browser to, have to happen or just your browser really uh, jet CPU going up? So here you really see, for example, that we have here a rendering layout task, so really following what the browser is doing. So how rendering here in the Internet Explorer is, for example, working, it just takes a specific component, numbers them, like you here see scheduling layouts, you just say, if you have a certain JavaScript uh, method, just layouting is just scheduled and then it's picked out at a certain lay later time out of the queue and then re-rendered and you can correlate those, the actual rendering activities to, to the JavaScript code that actually co caused that rendering because it might have happened uh, seconds before that. You're just creating a lot of events. You're, for example, setting all the CSS styles, creating all the re rendering activities on certain elements. And then you can also jump to, okay, where has it actually then been rendered or here going back what this has actually caused the rendering here. As well as really looking at different executions, like here we have a script execution, what really was going on in the script. So here we see a variable being set, an asynchronous execution. You really can follow those asynchronous ex executions over time and see what's going on. We're even flexible enough to, just a bit small here, capture all the arguments, for example, for the DOM set timeout, we see what the timeout actually was that has been set here uh, or what has been executed. So you will also get all those details out of here too. What were the parameters methods were invoked in? So very often I've seen that when people start also to debug kind of functional problems, they don't immediately start off debugging and say, okay, now I'm really stepping through all of the steps because first you want to understand what you actually have to debug. So I just recently worked uh, uh, with one of our users and they said, well, just what I'm doing, I'm selecting something in this 
uh, drop down field and then jumping to the next control and then certainly that select field gets uh, refreshed and reselected. So what's really going on? What we first did before really going into real debugging with debugging tools, just really looking what was going on on that page and when this control actually was accessed by which code and finding out what actually triggered that access of that component. Uh, at the end, we found out that uh, it was a very, let's say, uh, nasty bug. So just when it got into that text field, it validated the content of the text field. It was a, a, type, uh, a typing text field that helped for the selection of the select box. It realized, oh, I'm empty, so I'm selecting the zero entry. It's really fun debugging those things. So what you really get here is seeing really what's going on over here. And especially when you have, like here we have our um, key app events on specific controls, like in this case, the LST uh, object, which is the only one in Google. I can also say here, some just show me the LST stuff. Now filter away all other controls and I just see my keyboard events here, for example, for that specific controls. So that's for typing um, in here and to take into the keyboard field. Here we see a scheduled rendering then. So that's what's happening when you actually type, when you release a key in the Google search. It's just rendering here and it's not immediately updating it, but it's setting a timeout. So after some time, I execute some JavaScript and then the JavaScript execution has been triggered here is updating that field. Uh, that's then actually done by um, setting a specific script, script tag and downloading it here. Um, sometimes, however, I just want to know what actually took the most time on my web page. So, checking on our Google page here. In this case, it was under one drawing for sure, and as well as this layouting task. So, what I then can do is, okay, what actually triggered this layouting task? So, I just can kind of backtrack, uh, backtrace the events that have happened here. Like we see here, okay, what has triggered this recalculation of the layout? Okay, there was some rendering going on before that with some JavaScript execution. You can then really walk back and also see the code down here that has actually triggered those, uh, this rendering here. And can you find, okay, where did we spend most of our execution time? And also how often have things actually been invoked here on a certain web page? So you can just sort here uh, for example, we see that here we had 637 recalculations, schedules for recalculating the, light, the layer of the specific element here, um, having the possibility to track back which call code actually caused that layouting to happen. It was just what I was telling you before, so how the things actually work, how does those things are going on here to do all the layout, to do the real layout things. It really helps you to get an understanding of what's really going on in the pages from actually quite different perspectives and it's quite easy and straightforward to resolve those problems. So while that's quite nice if you do it on your own development machine, if you're working on your own development machine, but what actually happens now if you want to send this over to a colleague? So what, what do you do now? So you're not a developer, you just realize that something is not working, so how do you get back to people that uh, turn on, to another developer to take care of it? Um, what we've done here is we simply say that um, as soon as you close the browser, what I'll do right now, we see that our session automatically gets stored and we just can export it to a file uh, and make it available to other people, just sending it to them via email and they can open it and, and work with that. So instead of explaining to them what you actually did on that page and uh, what actually happened. You're sending uh, over, right over this, all this information and if, as you've seen with all the function parameters, how things were called, and then they can use it to really analyze what's going on. So that's especially helpful if you have uh, uh, your end users working with the web page and telling you you have been clicking around a bit and has been slow. Cool, now I know what really to look at, yeah? So you said, just start it, trace it, see what's going on there and then just send it over to us. And then the developer can analyze it and have a look at the data. Uh, 
that's pretty much on how you do the analysis here on, let's say, on when you really have a problem or you want to, want to investigate what's going on on the page, find out what's, what's really happening here. Um, another use case uh, that we've seen is what do you do in automated testing? So you have your water script, you have a Selenium script that do some functional testing for you or they do some automated testing for you. How can you collect this kind of data there that you don't might have to re-debug it and see what's going on, especially if you're doing testing in multiple browsers on different platforms you want to, like in this case, multiple IE versions, you want to see what's going on as you want to automate the whole process, so what's, what's going on here. Um, therefore, I've prepared a small sample for you. In this case, it's a water script. So what we're doing simply here, which is saying that we want to actually uh, trace for this specific water invocation. And additionally, we have the possibility to set specific marks in the code. So, to say, okay, this is what we were doing at that point, because especially if you're running a longer test that might run for 10 minutes or so, you at some point completely lose track uh, what has happened in the application. Now, okay, so you had a, there was a problem in the test script if you up, when we updated field X, Y, Z. Looking this up in a trace really can get a real nightmare because when was this happening in a test script? Well, it could work with timelines, uh, but at the end it's not really working well. So you here have the possibility to add uh, additionally, some marks in here in the code. So this was, I'm just loading the window here, that it was after loading the window, then I'm typing here a string again into Google, that was after typing the string, and here click submit, and this was after hitting the search. And then I see, okay, what kind of the page were really at what kind of time. So I'm just executing this now. So we see what we see in the background. It launches an Internet Explorer. It's going to the Google page. It's typing in right here, here. And at the same time, we start to record all the events here. And if now have a look at the code. Oops. We get also our nice markers here but we can also see how long specific actions have been taken. So here we see, okay, that was after loading the page, so that's all the loading stuff of the page. That was all the keyboard typing here, so that's still keyboard typing. And that was, that was after typing the search string in here. And okay, in case of submission, just realized that obviously had a problem submitting that page because there was something changed on the Google website. But Nevertheless, you see you can also track those events, especially in the script, which makes it easier then if you run into a certain problem to see what's going on, while also seeing what has been going on before that time. And it automatically stores this information for you, and after your, after your test runs, you automatically have available all this information for your diagnosis purposes. So whether you really want to go into kind of a performance diagnosis approach, or it's kind of post-mortem functional debugging of your replication. The good thing is it runs fully automated, you don't have to care about it, and you just get the results after your actual test runs. So this was kind of a quick tour uh, through Dynatrace HX edition. Uh, I think it um, could give you some overview of what, what it can do for you if you really want to find problems in the Internet Explorer, whether they're performance related or functionally related. Those who have been hunting down problems in the Internet Explorer probably know that it's not that easy. Uh, Set so a tool is completely free, so you can download it and use it as you like. Just go to a website and have a look at it. So we're currently in version 0.3, so what you've seen is the 0.3 version of our, of our tool here. Uh, we have already been using it in a couple of real-world examples on real-world websites, and we were quite successful. Also, other people like their tools. So if you don't believe us, for example, uh, Steve Soros has already used the tool and was blocked about it. He's also around. You can ask him, have you seen the good tool of those guys? Did you like it? If you don't trust us, you might trust him uh, more than us. 
a lot of photos have tried it as well. We, I don't want to mention the websites that said, okay, just have a look at us because we have some performance problems, you know. That's not so good for them. Yeah, but this version or at three, we're constantly uh, evolving the tool, adding new functionalities. If you go to the website as a forum, you can post comments, questions, and get in touch with us. So you see we're version 0.3 at the moment, but we rock. So we already have solved a couple of real-world problems with the tool. Uh, people find it useful. It covers quite a broad range of things that you want to do in web performance analysis. Um, that's actually the feedback we got. So if you're using Internet Explorer, I really ask you to check it out, give it a try. When you run into problems, see what you can find. Uh, yes, you can download it from hx.dynatrace.com. There's the forum there, all the information, contact details for us as well, so you can easily get in touch with us and find out what the tool can do for you. As well, you can get in touch with me, so either via email, via a blog, or uh, via Twitter. Uh, so I'm one of the guys being responsible for pushing HX Edition forward to give feedback, try it out, and see what it can do for you. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, six, seven, and eight. Uh, yes. Um, uh, other platforms are on our roadmap. Uh, but initially, we have chosen to support Internet Explorer because we've seen there, first of all, most of the problems coming up, and especially for uh, bigger enterprise applications, most of them running in Internet Explorer. Secondly, there's no real tooling for Internet Explorer. I know most developers like to use Safari and they like to use uh, Firefox. Um, so we're planning to support those platforms as well, but for the moment we focused on IE, but it is on our roadmap to support other platforms as well with the tool. Um, you will have to have them installed uh, because what we are just doing, we're just um, actually putting an agent as a plugin into the browser and just see what the browser is actually doing. So it's not kind of a browser emulation thing or whatever. It's really intercepting what the browser is really doing and then, then you can test them and using those browsers. But as soon as you have it installed, it will work in all of those three browsers. Any other questions?